The shutdown extended. Get used to staying home until the middle of May. But is the pushback now underway? What made you decide to go into the service today against the law? Uh, well, actually, the advice from the Attorney General says it's not. To say that no church, you know, let's not go to let's not go to Walmart then. Let's not go to the liquor store. We track the latest local trends in this fastest moving news story of our time and spotlight the stories we may be missing. Plus a distraction and a gut check with a stand up comic and one of our most colorful restaurateurs. A unique and refreshing take on staying at home all in the next 30 minutes on Week in Review. Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings. Bob and Marlee Scorley, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome everyone, I'm Nick Haynes. Glad to have your company this half hour as we dissect the news of our week. And if some of your emails and phone calls are any indication, Many of you are feeling frustrated, fatigued, and in some cases downright angry by how things are unfolding. We'll get to some of your questions and concerns in a moment. But first, we bring in our reporters checking in with us this week from 41 Action News investigative reporter Kat Reed, from The Call newspaper senior writer Eric Wesson, and from the Kansas City star Dave Helling. Thanks for Zooming with us. Um, I have to say, first of all, Dave Helling, um, when we had the first stay-at-home order in March, it was amazing to me how much regional cooperation there seemed to be among our political leaders all coming together. Are there cracks being exposed this week when we're now deciding to expand that order until, extend it until May 15th? Well, there are some minor cracks uh, that may well be plastered over, Nick, uh, because in the Kansas City region particularly, it's important, perhaps critical, that they are fixed. You just can't have a system in which Kansas is open and Missouri is closed or vice versa. You do have to have some coordination among mayors and governors and, you know, county legislators and others to make it work. Um, but I do think that they are talking. Uh, Mayor Quentin Lucas, who just extended the deadline to May 15th, says that he expects other states and cities to follow along with something roughly congruent to that. I do think the mayors or the uh, governors in camp, Governor Kelly in Kansas, Governor Parson in Missouri, their staffs are talking about this. Uh, I think there is a, re a realization that particularly in a region like Kansas City, if you don't all work together, it's going to disintegrate pretty quickly. But even when you have an order in place, it doesn't mean that people are going to comply, Cat Reed. I just at the very beginning of the program saw footage from your station of a church in Kansas that opened on Easter Sunday. The law was in place. The governor had her executive order. A, a judge rules in favor of that. And yet people still congregated at a church. That week, though, law enforcement wasn't enforcing uh, that. Um, is that changing now? Yes, we have learned it is changing. Douglas County announced that they are going to start enforcing this. Uh, it's a misdemeanor to violate that order. You could face about a $1,500 fine or up to a year in jail. And they will begin enforcing that. But it was a difficult position that law enforcement was put in. The order was put out. Then you have the attorney general telling them not to enforce it, recommending that they not. Uh, so it became a very political issue. Uh, but now Douglas County at least says they are going to enforce it. Eric, um, a lot of the uh, concentration of news stories was on the Kansas side, but were there some Missouri churches also opening quietly uh, away from the media gaze? I didn't hear of any. I didn't see of any. A, a lot of uh, pastors in the central city or the urban core, they had streaming services. I think uh, one church had a drive-in where people could drive in in their cars and sit in their cars and observe the church service from their cars. But I didn't hear of any in the Kansas City area where people, uh, where pastors violated the order just so people could come into church. What many people want to know now, Dave Helling, is not that we are now at a May 15th, we're still at stay at home. How do we ever get out of this situation? Are we learning anything new from the mayor this week about how we may phase out of this uh, slowly, gradually, and what would be the first to open, for instance? They're working on that, Nick, not just in Kansas City, but across both states. And I do think we'll get some guidance from federal officials. The president is going to talk about some standards and other 
um, uh, other groups are coming forward with sort of a how we can phase this in. But here's the important thing to remember. No matter what orders are in place or are not in place, either locally or statewide or even nationally, it will ultimately depend on whether the people feel like they're comfortable going back to work and going to bars and restaurants and baseball games and 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 office settings where you know people are are clo in close quarters. That's no order on earth can change people's attitudes. And so I do think there's an understanding that if they're going to make the reopening, whatever that is, work, they're going to have to be able to convince most Americans that it's safe. And that means testing, contact, tracing, other things. And frankly, I think there's a realization that we're not even close to where we need to be on those issues. And that's going to make this uh, slowdown stay in place for much longer than a lot of people think. Now, this week, we're hey, getting Nick. a better indication. Yes. Uh, I talked to the mayor this morning, and actually, one of the comments that he made was that he kind of wanted to even go beyond May the 15th. But here's the issue that he's facing. One, is not flattening out. The curve has continued to escalate. But he said that there's not enough test kits in the right. city. The only place that you can get tested at is Truman, unless you go to Oberlin Park. So I don't see it lifting anytime soon. I think in May, May the 15th, it'll probably be extended again unless something dramatically changes. They come up with a vaccine uh, and the car, and it actually starts flattening out more so than escalating. Yeah, I agree, because if you look at some of the models that uh, kind of were the basis for this decision of extending the stay-at-home order, it shows us peaking in late April. And those models assume that we hold the social distancing guidelines through the end of May, so I would not be surprised to see that continue through the month. Now, this week, we're getting a better indication of who is most impacted by the novel coronavirus. Public health data in Kansas City, Missouri, finds nearly half of those who have contracted the virus in the city are African-American, even though blacks make up 29 percent of the city's population. In Wyandot County, the picture is even bleaker, with a new report showing blacks now accounting for two-thirds of coronavirus deaths. The African-American population in Wyandot County, by the way, is 22 percent. Eric, what accounts for that? Is there one explanation or many? Well, there are several explanations, but the most key is that most people in the third and the fifth district have essential jobs, so they go to work. So they're out moving, they're out in the public, they're doing a lot of things in the public. Also, you have the issue of uh, medical equity in the black community or in the third and fifth districts where people don't have access to proper health care. You have high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, heart disease, and all of those things in the black community. And it's some gene that it attaches to that kind of escalates that sickness. Okay. I don't think that it can be said enough that social distancing and the ability to quarantine is a privilege. It's a privilege not afforded to everyone. Uh, there are people who have essential jobs who have to go out. They can't afford to lose that job. They're not in a position where they can be furloughed or work from home. And so we really need to look at the socioeconomic picture of who gets to quarantine, who has the ability to hole up and not go outside and do some of these things. You know, I saw that story about how African-Americans were being hit in Kansas City, making national news this week. The mayor himself tweeting about that. That's not where we want to see ourselves in the in the major news headlines. But what is the mayor actually doing about that? And what could he do about it, Dave? There's a short term answer, which is to try and get more tests, be more aggressive in communicating with the African-American community. And by the way, we should also mention that the Latino community is part of this as well. Actually, in Wyandotte County, the Latino population is bigger than the African-American population, and uh, they're uh, suffering in disproportionate numbers as well. So there's a short-term answer, but then there's a long-term answer, Nick. Neither state has expanded Medicaid, and so many of these folks don't have access to health insurance. I think one in five Wyandotte County residents lacks any health insurance. One in five. So you don't go to the doctor when you should. The diet maybe isn't as good as it needs to be. And then when a coronavirus hits, 
The impact is disproportionate, of course, and we're seeing what we're seeing. So I think the short-term answer is more communication, more outreach. The long-term answer is a healthcare system that takes these disadvantages into account. Now, two factors also making matters worse for Kansas Cityans who are already in more impoverished parts of the city. One is that the city has cut back on bus service and is now running on a Saturday schedule, which means if you are relying on the bus to get you to essential work, it's going to get tougher to do so. The second is an interesting story in the Star about how food delivery services are cancelling drop-offs east of Troost, getting most attention is High V in Prairie Village that provides grocery deliveries within a five-mile radiance of the store. But some customers have complained they've been refused that service because they live in East Kansas City, even though they are still within that five-mile delivery radius. Dave Helling, has that changed now that the Star Editorial Board has called them out? We're told anyway that the um, stores are making a better effort to understand what's going on. It's a very haphazard you know, system. People aren't ready for the demands on grocery stores. And so uh, I, I don't think there's evidence yet of systemic discrimination against stores east or, or residences east of Truce. I will say that the lack of grocery stores east of Truce just as a thing is an equally big issue. I mean, we just don't have the kinds of providers over on the east side that we do in other parts of the community, whether you're delivering or picking up or shopping for yourself. And that's a, another thing that will need to be addressed going forward. Kat. Yes, and, and just this morning we ran a story. I looked at some of the different online grocery delivery options, and it should be noted that they are completely swamped right now. Uh, we looked at how far out you have to schedule. You really need to plan about four days out if you're doing a Walmart or a high V delivery. There's some other options for Instacart. Shipped can do more things more quickly. But uh, even the shoppers, if you use one of the services, they'll say, hey, the store is packed, uh, might not be able to find all of your items, and it might take me a while to get there. So if people are using those services, it's really important to try and plan ahead because they are swamped. Yeah, and let me, can I just quickly, Nick, shout out to all the people working in the grocery store industry. I mean, those folks are really putting their health at risk. Uh, they're younger, typically. They don't make a lot of money, and yet they're going to work every day in stores to keep all the rest of us fed. And, you know, Kat talked a little bit about privilege, you know, the idea that you can get your groceries delivered or pick them up, that's privilege too. And, uh, you know, to talk to some of the folks as I have who, who, you know, check you out or stock groceries, they deserve a real tip of the cap, I think. And now they have one. Thank you for that, Dave. You know, it's also become a balancing act to reporting Kansas City these days. If you don't go all in covering the weight and enormity of this public health emergency, you could be accused of not taking it seriously enough. If you spend all your time talking about it, you risk viewer fatigue and worse. Angry emails like these we received after last week's program. Celso didn't like it when I asked the guests to come up with some other important stories happening in Kansas City we might be missing. Our panelists, he says, continue discussing the virus. It appears, he says, that all of the news outlets are pushing the same agenda of keeping fear in the minds of our viewers. What is your motivation for your industry to continue keeping the public hostage with such tactics, he says. And Heidi writes, I normally love watching the show, but I was so disappointed by the lack of covering anything non-COVID related. I'm sick of hearing it from every single news outlet when it's not that bad locally. I want to know why the potholes still aren't fixed. I hope we can hear about other issues Casey is facing. So let's look at her first concern. Have the potholes been fixed, Kat Reed? So the last story we did about potholes was on March 31st, and we talked to the Public Works Department. They are continuing to fill potholes. They said that they're doing social distancing amongst the crews and having them work in different shifts to keep them safe. Um, according to the city, they say that they have filled 85% of the potholes on the 311 complaint list. Uh, there are fewer people on the road, so maybe that'll give them a, an easier time filling some of these. What about violent crime, Eric? I saw the police chief this week put out in his blog saying, despite the fact that all around the world and around the United States, people are seeing a dip in crime in the two weeks prior to the, um, the emergency order going into effect in Kansas City, it's actually gone up in the two weeks afterwards. We're still having a homicide issue. The last time I checked, I think we were at 44, maybe 45 homicides. So people not being out, uh, we still got the anger issue and the inability to resolve conflict. And, and the homicides are still uh, going up, as well as the shootings. Now, I haven't looked at other crimes like robberies or things like that, but it, the homicide thing continues to go. Kat? I was just going to point out that 
property crime is down and partially because people are staying at home, keeping an eye on their stuff. And also you have a lot of businesses that are closed right now. Why is it we don't hear about KCI Airport anymore? Has the coronavirus changed the timetable uh, for that, Kat? Yes. So sorry to keep hogging the screen, you guys, but we also um, inquired about this. And I feel like I'm Dave Helling. I have so much to say right now. <laughs> when you're trapped at home, people feel they have to expand on these things. They don't have many chances um, to talk. So right now, uh, KCI construction is ongoing. They haven't paused. The crews are outside. They're remaining distant. Joe McBride, KCI spokesperson, says it is too early to say if the timeline is going to be impacted by this. Uh, they do have the funding to keep going for the next year and a half. But airline revenue is way down. And whether or not that's going to play into this equation later on kind of remains to be seen. Now, of course, the coronavirus having a huge impact on every area of our lives. 10% pay cuts for administrators are all at the University of Missouri System Schools, plus sharp cuts to programs there. Meanwhile, the second prison disturbance in a week at the Lansing Correctional Facility with inmates complaining they're not being protected. In the Jackson County Jail, multiple positive cases. Quietly, authorities have been releasing lower-level detainees and inmates is there any evidence, though, individuals with more violent backgrounds are also now being released, Eric? No, no. And I think uh, Sheriff Forte was very adamant about that, as well as Jackson County Prosecutor Gene Peters Baker. If they are letting people out, there will be those that would be less at risk of committing a violent crime. So I think the people that they're letting out are nonviolent offenders. Is there another big story we we're missing because newsrooms, as our uh, own viewers have claimed, are 24-7 coronavirus central, Dave? Well, there are other things going on. There was an audit yesterday, uh, a state audit of the combat program in Jackson County that was pretty critical of some of the spending from that, that tax. Kansas City is talking about parking problems and whether they should take another look at at uh, how many parking spaces are being built downtown. They're talking about streets and sidewalks, closing some streets. There are some other things that are going on. But the fact of the matter is, Nick, that the coronavirus is affecting everything that it touches. City and state budgets, by the way, are right in the crosshairs of that. The state legislature in Missouri said uh, yesterday that uh, they'll reconvene April 27th to take a look at the budget which will almost certainly be a laughable 30, 90, 60, 90 days from now when the full effect of the uh, economic impact of coronavirus is known. The city passed a budget. The, the, the reality is that you can't, in, in this current crisis, uh, there are few things that we do together that are not impacted. That's just the fact of it. And so I think one of the reasons we're reporting these stories out is because it makes a difference in almost everyone's lives. Several news stories happening that don't have a coronavirus connection. This week marks the 75th anniversary of a local man by the name of Harry Truman ascending to the presidency of the United States. You can't go to the Truman Museum in Independence, of course, to celebrate. It shut its doors last July for a mammoth renovation, rather. They have been offering online programs since the closure last summer. Could that have been a more well-timed closure? Meanwhile, a loss this week at your newspaper, Eric Wesson, as longtime publisher of The Call. Donna Stewart dies over the weekend. She was 65. Stewart had worked at the African-American newspaper since 1977. With restrictions on funerals, Eric, you were wrestling this week with what many people in Kansas City are now encountering uh, for the first time. Yes, we are probably, the family's going to have a private burial uh, within the next week. And then after things open up again, we'll open up and have a memorial service for her. But she's greatly missed. But can I just backpedal a little bit? A lot of, you know, people are talking about too much virus information. How much is too much when it's something that's affecting people locally and actually yeah. killing people? So Absolutely. I don't think there's too much. And if, they, if we didn't tell people, then they'd be saying, hey, well, I didn't know about this or this happened and I didn't know about that. So I think we're doing an outstanding job as the media, as keeping people informed. You know, tough to lose anyone right now when they can't fully be remembered, like Billy Birmingham, the Kansas City Fire Department EMT, the first line of duty death here related to the COVID-19 outbreak. And to the family of former Kansas City School Board member Fifi Weideman, she died this week at the age of 63. Of course, there are countless others who can't be celebrated for their life and work right now, but we do remember them, Kat Reed. 
Absolutely. It is so heartbreaking to hear the stories of families that cannot be with their loved ones in their final moments, that cannot bury them or celebrate them in the way that they normally would. And my heart just goes out to those people. I can't imagine what that's like right now and uh, just how difficult it is. Kat Reed, Eric Wesson and Dave Helling, thank you for reviewing the week's news with us. Uh, coming up, what can a stand-up comedian and one of Kansas City's most colorful restaurateurs tell us about life on lockdown? We'll find out next on Week in Review. Elliot Threet is a longtime Kansas City stand-up comic but makes most of his money running a mini-empire of restaurants and concessions at airports around the country. This man wears many hats, too. Stretch is an artist, live music venue operator, chef, and the owner of Grinders KC with two restaurants on both sides of State Line. Can we start on a bright note, Stretch? I saw you posted on Twitter. I'd like to take a moment to thank coronavirus for helping me lose almost nine pounds. Now, when we're told that alcohol sales are up 55% and fitness trackers surveys are showing Americans are moving 39% less, what is it that you're doing that the rest of America isn't doing? I'm doing everything the tracker is telling you not to do. I am moving. I, uh, I walk six to seven miles a day. Uh, I've been spending my time. I, I was telling my wife the other day, I wish the corona would end so I could slow down. Um, even though my businesses are closed, I'm still working 12, 15 hours a day. Are you feeling the health benefits too, Elliot? I've actually found stretches nine pounds. They were right on my side when I was reaching for a cheeseburger the other day from DoorDash. So I found your, your nine pound stretch. I'll bring it back down to you. We're told we should never put all of our eggs in one basket. And neither of you have done that. Elliot, you've got your stand-up uh, comedy business. You've also got all of these uh, restaurants and concessions at airports, not just here in Kansas City, but in Minneapolis and Dallas, Fort Worth. But did you ever think and anticipate ever in your life that all of those eggs would fall and crack at the same time? Well, you know, stand-up comedy was already kind of on a, a slow descent, so that was a little bit more expected. Uh, the concessions was a little bit different, though, but... Kansas City is in a, it's kind of an awkward silver lining because these last couple of weeks I've been on nothing but these conference calls and they're all talking about how they're going to have to reconfigurate their airports in this post pandemic world. So we're in the process of building an airport so we can actually do a lot of these things for the future that other folks are going to have to pay for, right? How about you, Stretch? Have you still got the restaurants open? Uh, are you still doing curbside or have you found like lots of other places that it's just not worth the trouble? So we closed down when the big rumor came about that the government was going to shut everything down. And I wanted my team to be safe with their families and have the supplies they needed. So we closed our doors probably about a week or two into this whole pandemic. Now, every layer of government is promising help. You have the federal government. We have our state governors and our own mayor saying we're going to help small business. You're important. Have you seen any of that help? Well, I think we just got our check from the government the other day um, for individuals. Uh, the rest of it, it's a it's a moving target. They might have been allocating the money, but we haven't seen any of the money yet. But you don't know if you have to pay it back. You don't know if there's going to be an interest attached to it. You don't know if it has to just go to labor. So it's just a moving target, uh, which is really difficult to navigate your future. We know there's a story in the news every day right now about a restaurant permanently closing. We saw Nick and Jake's just off the plaza closing permanently. Webster House, we've just learned, is closing permanently. Bravo out in Leewood closing permanently. What are you seeing in the restaurant business that's not hitting the headlines? There's a lot of competition out there. There's a lot of businesses that might not be run to the best of the ability. I mean, I closed two locations down in 2019. I won't blame it all on the pandemic, but coming out of it, it's gonna be another world, especially if it's all about social distancing. I mean, it's hard to have an operation where everyone has to eat. You know, normally you're at a table across from someone, but if you have a six foot spacing, you can't operate a restaurant with already very low overhead or margins uh, with, you know, 30 people in a restaurant. Everyone is being disrupted by this in some shape or form. Is there an aspect of this pandemic that you simply did not expect to happen, that you didn't anticipate, that has shocked and frustrated you? Well, you know, I'm actually kind of shocked by how quickly, at least in airport concessions, we're trying to segue. You know, it used to be when we first started in this business, we saw a lot of newspapers, not so much anymore. So I can envision this fall when you go out to the uh, KCI gift shops, you'll be getting surgical masks with chief's gear on them. 
You know, many people are getting creative during the lockdown. Elliot, uh, have you found a way to go online with your stand-up comedy? Perhaps uh, start charging $50 to stream yourself in the bathtub telling gags? I would love to do that. Here's the thing about online comedy, uh, because uh, Dave Chappelle is free online. And so is Jerry Seinfeld and Wanda Sykes and all these other folks, Gaffigan. So I think the great equalizer is when you watch those late night shows and it's just another guy in a room like me, it's not so special, is it? Although, Nick, you can watch my videos on YouTube as much as you want. Absolutely free. Well, thank you, Elliot. I'll be looking for the donate button on that YouTube channel. Does this at least provide you, though, with about 100 new routines for your comedy act? Or can we never laugh at this? Well, you know, uh, what's the Dave Matthews line? The, the space between tears is the laughter we shed. There's going to be a lot of tears before we, I think we can share any laughter in comedy clubs. And uh, ironically, overflowing wasn't the problem at comedy clubs. But the thing is, they forced intimacy. They had everybody get close together because laughter is contagious. Now they're just going to have to go back to, to, you know, separating it. Will your business be different even when we go back to normal? Stretch, will restaurants operate completely differently, even permanently after this? I think so. We're talking a little bit to our management team now and in the future on what it's going to look like. Is it going to be walk-up service? Is it still going to be table service? We're fortunate that we have two of our locations has big outdoor areas. So it depends on what the government says on how many people I can have in those areas. You'll see, I think, a lot more group kitchens that produce Italian, Mexican, Chinese pizza, Italian, whatever, versus individual locations. And people are going to be eating at home and outdoors. I'm assuming, Stretch, the buffets are also out. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> they should have been over a long time ago. <laughs> Stretch and Elliot Three, thank you so much for being with us on the special edition of Kansas City Week in Review. I always like to end this program on a positive note. And this week, for the very first time in this entire shutdown, my wife and I finally found a package of toilet paper in our local grocery store. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at KCPT. Keep calm and carry on.